All right, so today we're gonna talk about some material properties. We kind of mentioned a bunch of this stuff last week, um, or on Tuesday, kind of some generic terms for some properties. But today we'll kind of start further back to the basics and then kind of work our way forward um, into the, the actual properties that we measure and conditioning and stuff like that. <coughs> so, what's that? An atom. An atom, right? <coughs> So, what's in the middle? The nucleus, and it has what? Protons and neutrons. So it's got some that have no charge and some things that are positively charged. And these things out here are what? Electrons and those are negative, right? So what makes atoms stick together? Strong force. But what, what in here? That on these, the electrons have got kind of shells, right? The inner shell can hold two, then eight, then eight. And so they want their shells to be full. And so what they can do is, if they've got almost full, they can steal one from another atom that's next to it and they kind of bind together. Or they can share some electrons between the two atoms. Um, so that kind of makes them all stick together and makes all the other. The, the close forces and stuff. Um, it makes the different properties that they have. So if we look at this, the periodic table, and oh, I didn't like that. So you can see it's kind of grouped out by element. What's the number? Uh, the, number of electrons and protons. the number of protons, right? <clears throat> Which is usually equal to the number of electrons, but is it always? No. If you have different, it's called a, a what? And I still burn ion, right? Um, <clears throat> and so they're kind of grouped into kind of what properties? Things that are going straight up and down, like copper, aluminum, gold, conductive, they're in the same family. Um, nickel, palladium, platinum. They kind of get to, they kind of group grouped and they just fall into the table and they have the gases over here. <clears throat> so actually, let's go to here. If we go to links, and look at this dynamic periodic table. So on this table, if I could look over an atom, it tells me, see this, these numbers here? That's how many electrons are in the different levels. It's a pretty, it shows me which ones are transmission, transition metals, post transition metals, metal oil. And it also, I can drag this up and depending on temperature, I can see what's a solid, what's a gas, What's a liquid? So I can see the melting points of all the different uh, materials. If I can click on it, it kind of gives me a little thing about it. What about what's some of that other stuff? So like, we go to iron. This is pulling. You know where it's pulling this information from? Wikipedia. Wikipedia, which was that other link I had. But I also have the link for Wikipedia, which is this one. It doesn't have a nice pop up, but it gives you that same information. So we can kind of see how the elements are and what their properties are going to be. Um, we're not going to get too much into that. Well, one thing that we are concerned about with materials and when they come together is kind of how they're structured. So how do atoms kind of come together and, and make it? How do they, what shapes do they join into? we are talking lots of atoms. It 
into like crystals and different things like that, right? And how they link in those crystals affects how they're, how they're strengthened. So, treating processes first requires an awareness of metal and alloy structures. When a molten metal solidifies, the atoms arrange themselves into definite patterns called crystal structures. The two most common crystal structures in metals are body-centered cubic and face-centered cubic. These crystal structures grow uniformly in all directions within each developing crystal. As the metal cools, these crystals are confined by the adjacent developing crystals, forming grains. The line of intersection between grains is called a grain boundary. Because the grains form independently, their crystal structures develop tilted in various directions. All atoms in these crystalline structures are held in place by electromagnetic attraction to neighboring atoms. If a force or load is applied to a metal, these electromagnetic bonds stretch, allowing the atoms to move slightly. When the load is removed, the bonds pull the atoms back into position. If the applied force exceeds the metal's yield strength, those electromagnetic bonds will break, causing permanent stretching or deformation. To make metal stronger and more resistant to deformation, it's necessary to strengthen their crystal structures. This is done by adding alloying elements, which are other metals or non-metallic elements, like carbon. The addition of an alloy introduces foreign atoms within the crystal structure of the base metal disrupting the structural uniformity. This disruption results in increased strength. Alright. So by, by doing alloys, I like talked about last week, put other stuff in there, strengthen them, but also, depending on how the temperatures go, we'll talk about that a little later, you can control what type of crystal structure it has. <coughs> um, let's go to another one of these. Go to, we go to MATLAB. Now that's the other link here. This is just a big informational website. Um, you can either search by a material type or if you know what it is. So. So I'm going to look for 6061 aluminum. I'm going to look down and see what T8 is. And I'm going to see all kinds of properties about that material. So let's kind of jump forward. It's not. Let me go back to... We're at 1035 still. At the bottom of this, though, it gives me the alloy com components. So 1035 steel has 98 to 99% iron, 0.3 to 0.38% carbon, 0.6 to 0.9% manganese, 0.04% phosphorus, and 0.05% sulfur. That's what makes up this type of steel. <clears throat> so I can see from MatWeb exactly what goes into that steel. So if you have questions about a material, you can go to MatWeb and see more details about it. So yesterday, or Tuesday, we came up with some terms. We were trying to describe materials, right? We said it's strong, it's brittle, it's tough, it's easy to work with, it's flexible, it's conductive. So what do we really mean by that? So what do we mean by strong? Is concrete strong? If you push concrete, if you're standing on concrete, can you put a whole bunch of weight on that? Yeah. Okay. So it's strong in one way. Can you pull concrete apart, apart like that? If you or if you put some stress on it going sideways, can you pull it apart? 
Or if it's support on the ends and you put the weight in the middle, is that is it strong that way? No. No. So there's different types of strength. <clears throat> so we'll actually talk about all those different types. They're tough. So what is that is that light or heavy? Uh, easy to work with. So the general properties we use, right? How heavy is it? Density. So how tightly are the atoms packed together? How much does it weigh per unit? <clears throat> um, so strength. So we have four main types of strengths. We have tensile strength, which is pulling something apart. If you have something you're trying to pull on it, that's tensile strength. We have compressive strength when you're pushing it together. We have shear strength, which is what? Cutting. Yeah, cutting it. Cutting. Or like if you've got a couple blocks here with a bolt going through it, right? And it's one, it's got the force like that. That's a shear shear force on the bolt. And then we have torsion, what's that? Twisting. Twisting. So twisting it. So those are different for and different materials have different strengths in different areas. So it might be really strong in tensile, but weak on compressive, or really strong and compressive, weak on te uh, tensile or shear. Can you think of something that's really good compressive force, really bad shear force besides concrete? Ceramics? Yeah, ceramics. What about something that's really good on tensile strength, but really bad on shear strength or torsion? Concrete. Besides concrete. We would mentioned it. The other day. Carbon. What? Carbon. Yeah. So some composites like carbon fiber, fiberglass, they're pretty good. You can't pull them. Really good. They've got a lot of tensile strength. But if you hit it on, on the, from the side, it'll bend. <clears throat> or if you twist it, it'll it'll have some damage. Um, we have elasticity. So what does elasticity mean? And what else after you stretch it? It'll come back to its original, right? So that's kind of the name of it. Two different terms for that. We have the modulus of elasticity. So if you go to MatWeb, it'll have a modulus of elasticity. So they're kind of a measure of how elastic it is and it come back. We also have the uh, Poisson's ratio. So what happens when you squish something? But when as you're squishing it, what happens? No, besides that. So like think, think one of those little squishy balls. What happens when you push down on it? It goes out on the sides, right? That's the Poisson's ratio. It's how much a force in one direction is going to cause a movement in the other direction. Then we have Ductility and malleability, which are kind of the same thing but opposite. You want know what these are? Malleability is how you can mold it. Yeah, they're both. So one is pushing and one's pulling. But when you push it or pull it, it's going to bend and stay bent. So that's ductility and malleability. There's hardness and what's hardness? Note to say how hard it is. What's hard? How, how would you test if something's hard or not? Put a sledgehammer to it. Put a sledgehammer to it. Yeah, you can scratch it. You can see if you can scratch it. That's a test to see how hard it is. What else? Push something into it. Right? You got sand, you can push your hand into it to see that that's not hard, or some Play-Doh, or some plastic, and you can push on it and see how, how you push into it. So they'll do it, they'll put it down, they'll put it like a, a ball, and push on the ball into that surface to see how far they can push it. So that's how they test hardness, so it's how, how resistant the surface is to being pushed in on. <coughs> There's the electrical, the electrical resistivity, so we said it's conductive. But how conductive? And so we measure it by seeing 
how much resistance there is per foot of material, or per, per centimeter of material, or per length, of, whatever the length is. Okay? So if we go back to that mat web, there's one. So it's pretty conductive. It doesn't have a lot. Remember, ohms is the, the measure of resistance. But here's the hardness. And look, there's four different hardness scales that they use. And actually, there's more than that. There's like a shore hardness for things that are softer. It's like rubbers and things have a, sh have a shore hardness. Here's the tensile strength. When, it, when they're doing tensile strength and they're pulling on it, they, they test it until, until where it breaks. And this next one here, the elongation of break tells it how long it stretched before it broke. And that's when it, when it was stretching, it got smaller, what that final diameter was. Modulus, just to see the Poisson ratio, the shear modulus, that's the shear force. You kind of See what all this is. What's in there? And then there's also a machinability number that they put on materials. So how machinable is it? <clears throat> MATLAB doesn't have it, but they have it at other places. Um, so any questions on those? So, are, so why do we need to know this stuff? You need to know, see what it is. So, we go back here and look. Get the density, so about 7.8 more. And let's pull up. So density, almost eight, a little less than three. So about a third the density, right? We talked about that. Now let's look at the tensile strength. About 310 millipascals, or 45,000 PSI for the aluminum. About 71,000, or 72,000 PSI on the steel. So about two thirds, a little over half. Um, depends on how you're. You know, the, you know, the type of material could be between half and two thirds the strength, but at a third the weight. So that, so there's that. Yeah, it's a lot lighter, but not quite as strong. <clears throat> Last to see. Um, so you can kind of see. But look down here at the shear strength. The shear strength of the aluminum is 26,800. The shear strength of the steel, 11,600. So it's almost, it's over twice the shear strength for these two alloys. So there, there's benefits and trade offs in both things. So when, when en engineers are designing things, they're going to look at all these different things. <clears throat> This is more the engineer's work. Oh. Designers, you know, kind of some basic benefits of it. It's going to be a lot of strength stuff. Then get an engineer to, to do that part of it. Um, if you want a whole class on that, again, there's a materials class in engineering <clears throat> where they're going to go. They go through all the stuff in a lot of detail. Um, so then we're also talking about types of conditioning. So. We have thermal conditioning. And so conditioning is basically changing the properties of the material through a, a different method. So we have thermal conditioning. What's some types of thermal conditioning? 
heat treating. So for metals, we can heat treat it. And so we can make it stronger, softer, all kinds of stuff with heat treating with metals. Can we heat treat anything else? Really? We heat treat clay, right? We turn it from a soft, malleable thing into a hard thing. What else? Do we heat treat wood? Yeah, compressed. Yeah. We kill and dry wood, right? Kill and dry. That's heat treating. You're trying you're heat, you're treating it to reduce moisture. What else do we use heat to treat wood for? Think rocking chair. How to bend it. To bend it. We can heat wood, put some steam in there, and we can bend it. And it'll keep that shape. Right? <clears throat> so it's not just the metals heat treating, there's other things we can do with heat. We can do mechanical conditioning. So, is anyone taking a paper clip and bend it back and forth? What happens eventually? It breaks. It breaks. Why? Friction. Over and over yeah, you're adding stress. Yeah, you're using stress, and so you're adding stress fatigue to it. But also, what you're doing in that stress fatigue is each time you bend it, you're hardening it, right? Because the harder it is, the more brittle it is usually. So you're hardening it as you bend it. That's called work hardening. And so that's a good thing sometimes and a bad thing sometimes. <clears throat> so sometimes when they're, they're, you're pounding on something. They'll have to heat it back up to kind of relieve the stress, and then you can just keep working on it. Uh, <clears throat> so, but sometimes we want that work hardening. So, if like with wire, when they pull it through and they draw it, it gets smaller diameter, smaller diameter. And while it's doing that, it's making the surface harder. It's compacting those atoms back together so it's stronger, and that's what they want in the final product process. <clears throat> or they're hammering uh, shot peening. So they'll take something. They'll do it on the springs sometimes, they'll do it on other things, and they'll take it and they'll shoot it with like a bead blaster. Not to make the appearance look better, but to smash those atoms back in together so that this, the surface has some, some compressive forces built up. So the way if there's tensile stress in the middle, it's going to hit that compressive force on the outside and go, ah, I can't get through, and it won't break through. <clears throat> so there's different types of mechanical treating to make it stronger also. And then there's chemical conditioning. So using an extra chemical to change the properties. You have an idea what this is? Chrome. What? Chrome. Yeah, foam. Chrome. Oh, chrome. Um, that's more of a plating. Um, and a, so a, a coating that we put on it. So then we'll talk more about that when we get to the coatings. But it is. It's kind of. But you're not really changing the underlying steel. You're just adding stuff to it. What else? So like it's foam. It's foam. It depends on what kind of foam, right? <clears throat> Anything that's a two-part thing that you mix together, that's a, a chemical conditioning process. So like a spray foam, they're bubble liquids. You combine, they make a chemical reaction, and they, they change their properties. What? Can't you uh, treat metal with oil also? Like if you heat it and then cool it with... Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a... Yeah, because that's part of the thermal. Jump in the head. Yep. Um, um, but like epoxies. Oh, yeah. You add a catalyst to it, and it turns a liquid into a solid. Liquid plastics, when once they get the stuff to us, I've got some, um, some stuff we'll do when we get to the casting. We'll do some liquid plastic stuff. We'll make some urethane molds, some silicone molds and pour liquid plastic into it. And that has a catalyst and does a chemical conditioning to it. <clears throat> and yeah. So in heat treating, we have a few different areas. We have annealing, which is what? Do you know what annealing is? Annealing is making it soft. So you heat it up. And so does anyone know what that is? There's a really nice one in the book. But this is a, a phase chart. And so each of these different areas is a different type of steel, a different type of crystal structure within the steel based on the carbon content 
and the temperature. <coughs> and each one has different properties. It's the whole goal of heat treating. So normally when you're heat treating, heat treating to strengthen something, this part right here, this is the real strong structure. And we're right here, this is about 0.7% uh, carbon. So usually we're using carbons still down in here. And so you go up, you heat up to this temperature, and then you quench it down. So quench is rapidly cooling it, and it locks in whatever structure it was. <laughs> so annealing, though, is kind of the opposite. You want to go from a higher structure to a lower structure, something that's softer, that's more malleable. So what you do is you heat it up to get it this level, again, kind of moving around. And then you just heat it, you let it cool down really slow. So here, quenching, if you're wanting to lock it to make it stronger, you'd quench it in oil or water or salt water or something like that. If you want it to slow down, cool down really slow, you bury it in a pile of sand. Or you leave it out. And it's going to cool down a lot slower. So like if you take it, um, like when I was in school, we did a chisel. And so we got it out and we pounded on it and we got it to kind of have the shape that we wanted. Then we took it out, heated it back up, stuck it in a pile of sand. But it stayed there for two days and cooled down. Then when it came out, it was really soft. We could take a file, we could file that thing really nice, get, get it really sharp. But could we use that chisel like that? No. No, because it was still really soft. So we had to go back through, heat treat it again, bring it up to where it's strong. And we actually just retreated the tip of it because we didn't want the part that we hit with the hammer to be real, real strong because that, that's going to just shatter. We just wanted the tip to be strong. Heat that up, quench it in water. Now that's really strong. It's got a nice sharp edge and it can even be used. <clears throat> so you don't have to heat treat the whole thing. You can just heat treat parts of it. Um, so annealing is making it softer. Tempering is when you heat it all the way up, you quench it. So now it's locked in that structure, but it's real brittle. Like you said, all the, the, the grains kind of form on their own. Tempering, what we do is we bring it back up, not up to here, just kind of up into here, and kind of let the grains kind of work together, normalize a little bit, to give it a little more toughness. And then we bring it back down with, a, with another quick. Case hardening is what Oscar was talking about, where you heat it up and you dip it in something else. So if you want to add some more carbon to the outside to make the out, just the outside of it harder, you heat it up, you dip it in something that has a lot of carbon in it, so like oil. And then oil kind of goes into that, those first the outside layer of the material. Then you heat it up and normalize it, heat it up, dip it in it again. You can do that to make the layer on the outside deeper with more carbon on it. So that that's case hardening. Okay? So, yeah, so you can do it more than once each time you do the case hardening, it makes the layer deeper and deeper. Any questions? process that is used to modify a metal alloy's properties by exposing it to specific heating and cooling cycles. Different heat treating cycles can give metal very specific physical properties to make it more useful in its end application. Metals can be made harder, softer, stronger, tougher, more ductile, less ductile, brittle, or even flexible. A typical heat treating cycle for ferrous alloys is heat, quench, temper. Tempering is the reheating and recooling after the initial cooling. 
It makes the metal tougher and allows for variations in hardness. A typical heat treating cycle for non-ferrous metals, such as aluminum and nickel alloys, is heat, quench, age. Aging is the process of reheating and recooling non-ferrous alloys. It hardens softer alloys. The steps for heat treating of a part are cleaning of surface contaminants, racking to provide space between parts so the heat can circulate around them evenly, or fixturing to hold parts to a certain size or shape and then heating them in a furnace. There are several types of furnaces. The most common type of equipment utilized for heat treating is an atmosphere integral quench furnace. Parts are moved into the hearth for heating. Then either the part is raised for cooling into a gaseous atmosphere or lowered for liquid quenching using water or oils. There are also vacuum furnaces in which the parts are heated in a chamber where most of the air has been removed. In this manner, the surface of the metal does not oxidize. Argon or nitrogen gas is then introduced into the chamber and the parts are cooled down. Additional types of heat treating furnaces include induction furnaces and fluidized bed furnaces. After the heat treating process is complete, sample coupons that were included in the heat treating batch are destructively tested to confirm that the proper metal physical properties have been achieved. For more information on heat treating, contact any one of Metal Improvement Company's heat treating facilities. So, is heating the only way to heat treat something? No. What's another way? Cooling. You can cryogenically heat treat something. That's a kind of oxymoron in terms, but by super cooling something, you can also release some of those stresses. <clears throat> so it can give longer wear, better resiliency um, properties to things, both uh, ferrous and non ferrous alloys. So, any questions? <laughs> And when you show that thing when it raised, you could put in the heat, bring it back, put in the oil, or go up to the top. Is the top yeah. a lot slower? Yeah, so that's slower. So that'd be more of an annealing. Or it would, it would let it cool down and, and not lock in the, the thing. So by quenching, you get to that, you go from here down to, to a good temperature real quick. So it locks in that crystal structure. So it doesn't change after that. Yeah. So it, you get the same structure it was when it was hot. If you just let it cool in, in air, it's going to cool back down slowly, make bigger crystals, make it softer, um, and get down into a lower level. Or maybe add some more of the different types of uh, crystals in it. <coughs> what else? Anything else? <coughs> Anything else? Questions? Questions? No? All right.